Hi, Misha here, and we looked at the Mercury program and then the Gemini or Gemini program, and in those videos, I promised we would look at Apollo, and I thought it would end up being a two-parter. Well, it's going to be a three-parter, and there will even be a bit of an addendum, which could even be considered a fourth part, but we'll get to that when we get to it. I just couldn't think of a way to do this appropriately without, <laughs> yeah, breaking it up. In part one, we looked at how the Saturn system launched and got to orbit, broke apart, and we did show a CSM, but didn't really get into detail with it, more just how it connected, get to the moon and back. Here in part two, we're going to really focus in on it talking about the capsule itself the service module and how would re it would re-enter so I have a few here I have a Smithsonian 1144 scale I have a Corgi which is a slightly smaller it's about a one 150 scale, it's a showcase. And, of course, we have the larger executive display here. It's a 124 scale of the actual just capsule itself. And it's it's a big one on a wood plinth. So just as we've done with Mercury and Gemini, we'll talk about this most important version and really the only part out of this entire big system that would return to Earth. So let's kind of dive in and pick up in low Earth orbit. Last time we left off on the way to the moon with our assembly here. We will talk about the LIM or LM in part three really. Today I want to talk about the CSM, the Command Service Module, which is two distinctive things. So I have a total of five here. We've got two that are nominally 172 scale, two that are nominally 144 scale, and one that is nominally 124 scale. Although, of course, it's just of the capsule itself. With that, let's begin with these. This one is quite an inexpensive little kind of rubber figure. Hard plastic, but it does have metal, too, from the Space Voyager Action Products. Up here, we have a die-cast model from Dragon. And these are both of the uh, orbital version, like Apollo 7 or the Skylab or possibly uh, Apollo Soyuz project. You can actually tell those apart because they're painted white more. Anywho, and you can tell that because it does not have the S-band, the high gain antenna. It just wasn't needed. Overall length of the entire assembly is just over 36 inches with the command module being a little over 12 feet and the service module being just under 25 feet of that although a lot of it is the the engine bell if you take that away it's just under 15 feet this is actually slightly thicker than the uh, capsule this is about 12 and a half feet wide this is close to 13 feet wide gives you the overall idea. Same goes for here. While this one is not very you know, high quality, it's fun, and it does have the ability to actually separate the two, whereas the only other one I have that does actually is this little one, which is again 144 scale. Anyway, let's talk about the 
service module. This obviously provided uh, well, services. It um, was not pressurized. You couldn't go back here. Even though this is just so it can plug in. In the center, it actually did have a pipeline. It was about 44 inches running down the center. And this cylinder was divided into six sectors or compartments. And uh, they contained oxygen, fuel, everything needed to go. They also contained three power cells, which produced electricity and water for the crew. First tested out on Jiminy, put into full implementation here. And that, of course, connected directly to the capsule. Then these two would pretty much be connected throughout the entire flight, right up until they were prepping for re-entry. The CSM test flew in February of 1966 for the first time, at least early versions. And the first crewed flight would be in October of 1968 with Apollo 7. Apollo 1, as it would later be known, was supposed to be the first crewed flight in February of 1967, but um, there are problems. I think I just said 66 earlier. I meant 67. Sorry, I've been talking a while. <laughs> you get what I mean, though. Hopefully. The Block 1, Block 2 thing was really unfortunate. This engine which used a type of hydrazine was specific to this. This was the AJ-10-137 engine. Back in 62, when NASA was soliciting bids for these, which ultimately would be won by North American, they were still considering direct ascent. So the idea was the <laughs> module needed this to lift off from lunar surface because the whole thing was going to land. After they selected lunar orbit rendezvous. Well, this became necessary for course correction and uh, getting into and out of lunar orbit and other types of maneuvers. Still very important, but uh, at least it's not meant to land and whatnot. It's more of a corrective engine. And that's the, th the problem with the Block 1. The Block 1 was made for earlier specifications. They never should have flown. Uh, it was kind of useless, but since money and time had already been devoted and since uh, versions had already been built, Apollo 1 was supposed to be the only Block 1 flight. Now, there were some unmanned Block 1 flights, and that you now it's fine, why not? But, um, of course, the hatch is a very famous issue with the Block 1 and uh, lack of fire retardant. And the thing is, they knew this. Block 2 was already well under development before the Apollo 1 accident. But it was 1967. They were feeling the pressure. Russia was about to use their new Soyuz, and the heat was on. And now, as it happens, Russia would have its own tragedy with Soyuz that year. But they did not know that. Regardless, the, uh, the disaster of Apollo 1 would lead to full uh, Block 2 implementation and uh, even further changes, and that's what we would have here. And there were, were a few different uh, versions and types and, and configurations of these. For the uh, Earth orbit style here, the uh, service module was as light as 32,000 pounds. The uh, capsule was about uh, 12,000 some odd thousand pounds. This was achieved on Apollo Soyuz by not only removing fuel, which was often done for like Apollo 7, so the Saturn 1B could launch it, but also even fuel tanks. And on the uh, Soyuz mission, they actually removed one of the three fuel cells. <laughs> Again, they didn't need it, so why not you know, take it off? And that's, that's what they would do. It, they would remove propellant and everything to lighten it up so that the Saturn 1B could lift it or if it just wasn't needed for the mission. But once we start going to the moon, weight starts going up. So, let's bring out the little corgi here. 
This has that high gain antenna, which was flown on all the moon missions. Plus, as far as I know, Apollo 9 had it as well, because it was a kind of a, a test. This is a nice little model. It's not quite 144 scale, but it's close, and it's all metal for the money. It's pretty nice. nice. Now, the earlier missions, the G and H types, one of the six sectors was left void. It had ballast in it, but it was empty. It would be utilized later, though. But it would have full fuel cells. After Apollo 13, a backup battery was also added to the uh, service module. Pretty, pretty obvious reasons why. So changes would be implemented on and on. Like I said earlier, even the paint would change sometimes. And this would be what would go to the moon dock to the LM there. Again, quite a nice little model. This is a pretty neat little plastic 140 scale model from the Smithsonian. It's it's just it's neat. Unfortunately, I'm kind of surprised it doesn't separate. But now let's talk about the command module, the CM itself, the space capsule. I'm not an engineer. I'm a historian. And while I'm not a technical person, I find it infinitely fascinating how people live and work in space. And this is, well, where they did it. And Apollo was the largest capsule by far at that time, even larger than Soyuz. Sorry, I use a little blue tack to hold these doors on because, uh, yeah, they tend to like to fall off on shelves. So there might be a little residue. Internal habitable volume is between 210 and 218 uh, cubic feet. Uh, it just kind of depends on the source you kind of consult, so I don't know. Of course, you have a crew of three. Over on your left, you have the commander. In the middle, you have the command module pilot. And on the right, you have your uh, lunar module pilot. The commander serves as, well, commander and also pilot. In the center we have the navigator and since the lunar module is not really doing anything here he serves as the flight engineer and their controls and gauges are for that. There's one big panel that they all face into in the front. It's uh, roughly seven foot tall and uh, well, seven foot long and three foot tall, I should say. Although in space, it doesn't really matter, does it? And while there are plenty of duplicate controls in here, the uh, idea is to give each one something special. I'm sticking you in. I don't know what you see. Who knows? We each have couches. These are actually made from hollow aluminum, aluminum, aluminum tubing. And they have a type of cloth that's fire retardant over them, stretched over them. And for sleeping, you can be restrained in them. They can move a bit and be folded up and down, what have you. There's a lot of controls in here, as you might imagine. In fact, over 560 switches and things, not to mention, you know, 70 plus lights and things and displays and gauges and blinkies. Uh, it's a complicated machine. Plus circuit breakers and everything else on the sides. So this is where they sit for launch. Much like with the service module, this is divided into six bays, as it were. In the rear bay, behind the seats, we stow a lot of equipment. Uh, cameras, but also things like the fire extinguisher. Also, I mentioned in the first video that there was plans to use an Apollo capsule as a rescue vehicle during Skylab. So that version actually was able to fit two more crew seats back here for a total of five. Of course, it was just a rescue mission, so they didn't have to stay long. From there, we have the left side intermediate bay and the right side intermediate bay. The right side is very important because it has the waste system. The left side has gear too. Then you have the forward left bay, forward right bay. 
mostly housing, more equipment, food, medical. The biggest bay is the one below. It is really where navigation could happen, observation, and frankly where the crew could stretch their, uh, their legs a little bit, which is a first for an American space capsule. Neither Mercury nor Jiminy ever had room to do that. And of course, like I said, it's only 12 feet by uh, about 11 feet, but that's in a gravity and space floating around. And compared to what had come before, over 200 cubic feet compared to 100 or less, that's quite a good deal. And we have a total of five windows. The two on the lower bay here are for making astronomical observations, also for uh, docking maneuvers. Then we have two, one on each side, you can see here. And these windows are roughly nine inches. It's a uh, pretty thick triple paned glass as you might imagine and there's a somewhat smaller more porthole type window on the uh, hatch here and the hatch was designed to be fast and easy to open not just because of Apollo 1 but also because they were expecting Tended to use it not just on the ground but in flight. That would be kind of like Gemini, but even more so. And of course, the I'm sure my blue tack sticks. The LM would dock in the front here. After all that was done, the equipment would be jettisoned. But that that shows you the um, connection. Really interesting interior. If you're interested, there I'm sure there's some really good videos you can. Uh, find online showing you but this is a nice scale model of this kind of showing you how big it was in fact while he's in a full space suit so it's not really accurate they would have been in a shirt sleeved environment as it was called here is an astronaut roughly in the same scale as the uh, capsule again he's suited up so not really quite fair, but that's what I got. In this scale, about 2.8 inches is correct for a human. Apollo, used for many missions and quite successful, barring Apollo 1, of course. Speaking of missions, I've mentioned types, classifications. Let's run through those briefly, and then we'll get to the moon. Here's that Space Voyager's toy again. One neat little feature it has is you can open the door, and um, while well, they're not obviously removable, because it's 1, 144 scale, they're there. They even have some paint on them. Pretty neat. Just wanted to show you that. For a toy, it's there's a lot of neat little fun features with this. So the mission types. Well, the A type was unmanned test of the Apollo module. Because of 67, it was 66, 67. We had Apollo 4 and Apollo 6. The B type was an unmanned test of the lunar module, Apollo 5. The C type, that was Apollo 7, a crude test of the module. The LM is not included in this, so yeah. Next was supposed to be the D type, which was an orbital test of the CSM and LM, and by orbital I mean Earth orbital. However, the LM just it wasn't ready yet 
So Apollo 8 is a really interesting story. It's kind of the redemption of Apollo 1, and I'm sure exactly what Gus and uh, Chaffee and White would have wanted. Apollo 8 was kind of squeezed in. It was sending Saturn V up with a complete loaded CSM, no LM though, to the moon, and to orbit the moon. And quite fittingly, this was done Christmas 1968. It was launched on the 21st. He got to the moon roughly Christmas Eve. This, because it was kind of slotted in, was called a C prime type mission. And it would actually negate the E type mission, which had been planned, which is kind of a midpoint test mission. It wasn't needed. So, yeah, C prime replaced E. D we tested in 1969 the lunar module in orbit with a full system things are going well and you might think well that was Apollo 9 Apollo 10 we're gonna land on the moon that was actually the F type mission which was a full dress rehearsal going to the moon they would take the LM out skirt the moon's surface but not actually land they did not actually carry enough fuel to land and take off again. So if they had landed, that would have been it for them. Plus, they needed valuable data on landing sites and oscillations and telemetry. I mean, no one's really ever been to the moon before except once at this point, a few months earlier. So, yeah. Well, that gets us to the G-type mission. July 1969. Apollo 11 was a G-type mission the goal of the entire program. It was one of three flights they would attempt that year to try to meet President Kennedy's goal. They're going for it, and it lifted off on July 16th, 1969, and would soon, not quite four days later, orbit the moon. Over the moon, Reversing the docking procedure, the service module and LM would separate and the LM would begin its descent trying to find a place to land. And it would actually keep these legs folded up for most of its time right up until it was essentially hovering, picking a landing place. Now one nice thing, uh, again, this is again from the Space Voyagers, a lot of your models or toys of the LM don't have folding legs. What this is missing, unfortunately, is the ladder on one of the legs, but, you know, ebbs and flows. It's Im pretty much impossible to get the perfect example, but for what it is, it's uh, it's pretty neat. So they would uh, have an interesting time finding a landing spot, but with very little fuel left, they would plunk down on July 20th, 1969. Now after landing, they would actually have a lot to do, staying on the lunar surface for nearly seven hours before Neil Armstrong would step out on July 21st, making his famous flubbed line, <laughs> since I had him out here, and 20 minutes later be joined by Buzz, everyone's favorite loony astronaut. Now this first mission would be quite brief. They would only walk on the moon for two hours and some change. And in fact, the whole expedition would be on the moon for under 22 hours. Meaning that they would soon go back up to meet the command service module and Everything would go quite well, eventually splashing down on July 24th. But 
as to what was done on the moon, that's for part three. Of course, while Apollo 11, the G type mission was the culmination, it was not at all expected to be the end. In fact, they had planned up to Apollo 20. The next missions, Apollo 12, 13, and 14, were slated to be H type missions. These were considered precision landing missions. And once they figured out how to land exactly where they wanted, the plan was to have the J type missions, the endurance, long endurance, scientific deep investigation missions. But budget cuts scaled this back to just Apollo's 15, 16, and 17. Apollo 12 would actually fly in November of 1969, so they did it twice that year. Apollo 13 was 1970. Well, we know what happened there. That caused a little pause in the program. But Apollo 14 would be a return to space with Al Shepard. That would be in 1971. And then later that year, the first J mission, 15, would uh, take off. The final two J missions would be conducted in 1972 and would end that December. 24 men landed on the moon. Would have been 26, but Apollo 13, and uh, rightfully so, 13 is often considered the successful failure because everyone did return home. And it also, frankly, kind of restored confidence in NASA. And even though Apollo was cut short by at least three missions, this actually left resources, including a spare Saturn V system, to do Skylab. So they took a uh, Saturn V, reworked the third stage to be Skylab. It went up in May of 73, it was the U.S.'s first space station in low Earth orbit. And shortly thereafter that month, it would be joined by Skylab 2, which was a crewed flight with the low Earth orbit version of the system here. And throughout that year, Skylabs 3 and 4 would launch, with 4 returning home in February of 1974. And that was nearly the final Apollo flight. But then, in July of 1975, we had the Apollo Soyuz test program, which I want to talk about in a different video because it's very interesting and often overlooked. At this time, the space shuttle was well under development. Apollo was kind of old news, but it was also reliable hardware. They built a total of 19 command modules. Some were for ground testing, some were for spares, but, you know, several were used. From Apollo 7 through 17 on the moon program, and then, of course, four more in the 70s to support low Earth orbit events. So, uh, total of 15 successful flights, plus one more on standby as a rescue vehicle. It would have been interesting to see five people in one of these. Oh well. <laughs> Very interesting to me, I think. In some ways, it might have been America's best space vehicle, Apollo that is. It was uh, quite successful, especially with the primitive computer it had at the time. And next time we'll talk about the LIM, or LM, which was really the first true spacecraft. In other words, something not designed for anything like atmospheric use. And we'll talk about, where did I put my astronaut? I don't know, send him somewhere. We'll talk about what the astronauts did on the moon for the G, H, and J missions, and kind of get into more details with that. So, appreciate you hanging out. Hope everyone's having a good one. This is Misha. Catch you very soon next time.